I think with both of those points, what we're dealing with is trying to strike the right balance between certainty for all users of the local plan, and that includes residents and community groups and applicants and everybody, versus flexibility, which is also both of which are requirements of the MPPF that you should be clear, but you should also be sufficiently flexible. And there is clearly a balance to be struck in there. On the issue of building heights in stories, uh, I think Ms. Barnett's absolutely right. And in a good example is in document 9D1, which is the future Wimbledon SBD, which on page Page 51 shows two tables, uh, and the first table is the building height of existing, <clears throat> of existing buildings in Wimbledon Town Centre and the story height. So, for example, um, there are four story buildings that are both 14 metres high and also 18 metres high existing in Wimbledon today. There are um, six story buildings that are 24 25 27 and yep 27 meters high so it just goes to show that as Ms. Barnett said if a building is purely residential and has the lowest floor to ceiling height uh, and, uh, four stories if that building is commercial with a higher floor to ceiling height the same number of stories it will be a taller building because of the floor to ceiling height we have to strike the balance between clarity as well, because most people don't go around talking about 22 metres ordinance datum. Uh, they talk about stories. So the plan as written does reflect the balance, I suppose, between being clear for people who aren't involved in the property industry and also being clear for the detail of applicants. I think it's something we need to reflect on because of this big difference, you know, the 14 to 18 meter, for example. Um, we need to make sure the plan is readable, but there is a big difference. And we, we don't want to get into nitty gritty of saying, if the building is part commercial, then it could be this high. And if it's part residential, then it could be that high. Um, but we do pick up Ms. Warren's point on that, that there is a difference in, between stories and meters. Um, and we have to strike the best balance on that. So if we could take that one away. Yeah, and I, th I think the other thing that, that struck me was which one takes preference if someone, if it's before a decision maker, there's a 10 story one that's slightly above 40 meters or is it the 40 meters, you know, which one of those? Um, and it's that clarity point, I think. Although I appreciate what you say in, in most um, contexts, people do think in terms of, of story heights, um, but if, if yes, if you could take that away and think about that in terms of, of the clarity of the policy, please. Ms. Barnett, did you want to come back in? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a very short final point that um, just to clarify that we are um, not challenging the 40 meter reference. We're just saying for simplicity and for clarity, there should be one reference and that should be the meters in terms of height parameters rather than stories. Just a clarification point. Thank you, Ms. Barnett. Mr. Michael. Uh, thank you. Yes, I would accept what Ms. Barnes is saying that I think we should remove stories in favor of actual heights in meters. And my suggestion would be you just have a simple asterisk next to the and the number of meters in, a, in, the, in the plan. And at the bottom of the page, you'd say, usually this means so and such and such stories in residential and such and such in offices and leave it at that. I think people will then easily be able to understand what is being uh, proposed. Uh, as far as the uh, point about uh, just having indicative heights and being flexible, I think that was the other phrase. Um, my view would be that would be entirely deplorable. Um, why? It'll become a judgment value plan where the actual uh, outcome will result in uh, long delays in discussions, usually private, between the council staff on the one hand and the development industry on the other, and there will be no clarity of what is likely to happen on the site as far as local people are concerned. But local people are concerned. It's their town. 
should be their plan. So the developer will have more or less a free hand, which I don't think is what a plan should do at all. Instead, we need clarity in the plan. That is one of the things that is required. And one of the ways of getting clarity is to cut out the discussion and simply say, these are the embargo heights above road level or whatever. And that will cut out a lot of delay, a lot of useless discussion. And when it comes to it, when the council has agreed a, or has decided that a 12 story, I think it is building uh, in one part of the town center in Wimbledon uh, would be what it wants. It has recently approved one which is two stories higher. Oh, right. So what does the local community think about that sort of thing? It says, well, the plan says one thing, but actually the council does another. None of that is helpful. And I think if, as long as we all know where we stand, then let us have these embargo heights. There's also a benefit for the development industry because if you know that there are embargo heights, you will be able to do your, this is the developer, you will be able to do your viability studies and work out before meeting the planning office whether or not it's worth your while. If it isn't, come back later when it is. So I feel that this idea of flexibility, it sounds lovely and indicative, it all sounds lovely is actually just a developers in the developers interests and we will have what the development industry decides for the town and sorry about this the development industry is not responsible for the planning of the town that is the responsibility of the local people and the council thank you mr michael miss butler Yes, I'm picking up on Mr. Michael's points there, actually, and we do believe that actually the Regulation 19 phase of Merton's local plan, which was not in general conformity with the London plan, did offer a very flexible approach to tall buildings. And it seems clear to us, both from the GLA's representation to say we weren't in conformity and our subsequent action since, that while we, we all see the the appreciation that no one you want, want to get stuck into an argument about whether a 22 story a 22 meter building was fundamentally unacceptable to, compared to the 21 meters prescribed in a plan nor do we nor were we in a position to offer a complete flexibility that would give no certainty to residents or to applicants or to landowners what could happen on the site and again, it's about striking that balance that's in the MPPF between clarity and flexibility. And we believe that the plan as modified achieves that with the specific building heights in the places that are noted. And considering the modification that we propose on meters. And um, we've been following Lambeth and Brent's local plans uh, as well, although probably not to the level of detail to be able to comment on precise buildings. Um, we note that they're in, in one case, their allocations don't seem in Brent's case, their allocations don't seem to have building heights within them. Um, I couldn't explain how the plans got to that stage without um, being adopted. And in Lambeth, as Ms. Parsons said, uh, they don't think they've got any site allocations. So while it's interesting to see what's happened elsewhere, Brent and Lambeth are not Merton. Um, we haven't been through the same level of evidence and um, GLA challenge and reconciliation of that challenge. So we believe that the plan should remain with a level of certainty on building heights that we propose within it uh, and describing them in the strategic diagrams as up to a certain number of meters and in the uh, site allocations as the same. And, and that's a, an approach that the mayor considers to be in general conformity. Yes, uh, there are two documents on that. Um, GLA March Statement of Common Ground, which is OD13A, and that was uh, submitted to the examination on the 28th of March, and that has been updated by OD13I, which is a statement of common ground with the mayor and the statement of general conformity. 
and as appendices to both of those, it sets out the policy, including the specific heights. Thank you. So we spoke uh, this morning in, in sort of general terms about heritage and how, how those um, heritage assets have, have been taken into account in, in generally in, in, in terms of the tall buildings policy, but specifically in terms of Wimbledon, there's a number of allocations that may have effects on heritage assets. So how, how have they informed um, the, the allocation policies for those particular sites? Thank you, Inspector. And I draw your attention to three documents. They are the Conservation Area Character Appraisals, which is 12D9, or a character study, as previously mentioned, 12D1, and the Future Wimbledon SPD 9D1. And in particular, the Future Wimbledon SPD, which forms the bulk of our evidence for the Wimbledon policies. The SPD was consult consulted on extensively uh, twice as set out in our statements and as mentioned, I think by Mr. Michael um, earlier. Uh, the Historic England, as I read out earlier, um, responded to that. And that really looks at the detail of the heritage assets in Wimbledon. The heritage assets include conservation areas that touch the town centre, that are within the town centre and beyond. They include statutorily listed buildings and structures, and they also include nearby heritage assets, such as rising up Wimbledon Hill, there is conserva more conservation areas. And while they might not touch the town centre boundary, there's a level of visibility from the conservation area to the uh, town centre. And the, as I said, in our statements, the sites are uh, the sites in Wimbledon that propose taller buildings are informed by extensive landscape and design analysis of that. And that's that set out both in 91, uh, mainly in 91. And as mentioned earlier, it takes account of the significance of heritage assets and uh, seeks not to harm them. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Uh, Mr. Michael. Yes. In two cases, just as an example, we have tall buildings being encouraged in the plan immediately adjoining uh, listed buildings, and also in one case, a conservation area. Uh, example one, beside the theatre, that is site WI2 on page 281, tall buildings are encouraged. This is the uh, vacant car park site. Really? Uh, I wonder how a tall building can enhance that historic building, which surely, looking at its context, uh, and the buildings around it would benefit from have a building of roughly the same height, I would guess, uh, doing what it has to do. But a tall building, I cannot see any reason for that enhancing the theatre. On the contrary, one might well feel that it's going to detract somewhat from it. So that uh, seems to me to be uh, rather a misplaced uh, wording in the plan. Secondly, the Centre Court site, built in the 1980s, now being refreshed by a firm that uh, largely, not entirely, I think, but largely wants to renovate and adapt, which we would fully support, being sensible on sustainability grounds, if no others. Uh, but the Centre Court site contains the old town hall, a listed building, and also the listed fire station frontage. And also a substantial part of that site is within the Broadway conservation area, as indeed is the land or buildings directly opposite it, which incidentally was hardly mentioned at all in the preamble, which I think is really not good enough. And 
in both case, in that case, the center court side, again, how is a, an historic uh, listed building or two listed buildings and a conservation area going to be enhanced by uh, a reference to taller buildings being encouraged? That is the, the sort of phrase which should not really be in the plan. And so I have significant doubts about whether the criteria that the council would be using to assess tall buildings will be sufficient to hold back um, rather aggressive uh, buildings on those sites because the plan is already saying that taller buildings are going to be acceptable. I feel that that is really rather contrary to London plan policy and might well be unsound. If you want to make it sound, then go to the Wimbledon Society's <laughs> long contribution or responses to the plan and alter the wording in the ways that are suggested. So, so specifically in, in terms of those sites that Mr. Michael has drawn our attention to, so the, there's those heritage assets, a very list of buildings that are either within or very close to the site. So how is that informed? Just generally those kinds of heights that might be appropriate on that site, given that that's, that's possibly a very sensitive context, isn't it? Yes, absolutely, Inspector. And this really goes back to, once again, for example, the difference between stories and meters. So, for example, in the case of site WI2, um, it's just, which is beside the listed, the statutorily listed uh, New Wimbledon Theatre, um, the site in the strategic heights diagram is just beyond the cluster, the diagram for tall buildings, um, which talks about up to 24 metres. The theatre itself, because of its dome, is actually 27 metres high. So while in the London plan definition, 24 metres is a tall building, the theatre next door remains taller. Um, and I think there's several cases and it's in, uh, where, where just because a site is adjacent to or near a heritage assets, as um, Ms. Parsons colleague, colleague uh, David English told us when he met us, just because you can see something from a heritage asset doesn't mean it's bad. Um, that we must assess these things carefully and we must um, strike a balance between not having, say, a very domineering height perspective, oh, looming over a heritage asset, for example, or detracting from it versus supporting Wimbledon as the borough's only major town centre allowing a relatively modest increase in building heights compared to those existing heights identified in 91 um, and supporting that level of growth and change while recognizing that not probably all sites in Wimbledon, uh, certainly most of them on the north side of the Broadway are all going to be visible from heritage assets because the, the heritage assets adjoin the town center or the statutorily listed buildings, for example, at the theatre or at the absolute main train station are always visible from 90% from of Wimbledon itself. So as set out in the Wimbledon SPD, which was responded to by Historic England, we, have, we believe we have struck the balance between um, allowing taller buildings adjacent to or near heritage assets without dominating those assets and supporting Wimbledon as a major centre. Did you want to come back here, Mr. Michael? I think there's a pretty fundamental difference, really, which I'm not sure that anyone can bridge. But really, that little phrase that is in the site allocation should come out otherwise it'll give us problems if as the council is saying the criteria will allow for a sensitive interpretation of building heights and so forth on these two adjoining sites sorry the two sites which <clears throat> adjoin these 
to, to these listed buildings, then that should be sufficient. But to see in the site allocation, the phrase taller buildings will be okay, or whatever the actual wording is, is I think, first of all, it's unnecessary if the criteria are going to be applied. And secondly, it will encourage the developer to think that they can in some way get past some of the criteria because taller buildings are specifically encouraged. Taking out that little phrase in both cases would be a great help, and then the council's criteria can be used. Thank you, Mr. Michael. So there's a, I get the, the, the difference of opinion on this specific uh, issue, and we'll, we will reflect on that as the examination progresses. But if there's anything at this stage that you'd like to add? Nothing to add, Inspector. Thank you. So um, we've, there's no further questions I have, particularly on the Wimbledon sites at this juncture. Um, obviously, we're going to come back in stage two to talk about the neighbourhood policies more generally and, and the, the wording of the allocations. But Mr. Michael, was there anything uh, specifically on Wimbledon you'd like to draw to the attention of the hearing at this point? Uh, yeah, sorry about leaving that light on. <clears throat> There is a further point which is not in your questions, Inspector, uh, and that is to do with energy, tall buildings and energy. But do you feel that you want to explore that or not? Um, please feel free, Mr. Michael. We, we had a, a discussion about the climate change policies of the plan um, last week, but um, if, if, if you make the point and we'll uh, see where it goes thank you we were our attention was drawn to two studies that have been made that uh, i paraphrase <clears throat> tall buildings are less energy efficient than lower buildings the references there would be uh, the first one is offices of 10 stories or more use 75 percent more energy per square meter than those of five stories or under and the organization is UCL Energy Institute 2018. That's the first reference. <clears throat> the second reference is taller buildings are less energy efficient than those around four stories. And the reference to that is Smith and Gordon 2020. And also separately, UCL, Shimitsu and others, 2020. Thirdly, tall buildings cause shadowing. One of the things that we do, sorry, we, one of the things that are very much being pr promoted, photovoltaic panels, mostly, in or on roofs. We know that PV panels use energy from light, specifically the sun, and if they are shaded, they more or less make no electricity. Tall buildings cast shadows. Shadowing Mrs. Smith's roof in Acacia Avenue by a tall building nearby, or indeed any building nearby, will reduce the amount of energy that her PV panels will produce. And bear in mind that electricity is ideally made in the cold winter months, and it's most needed. Uh, unfortunately, because of where we sit in the climate, in the earth, I should say, the maximum height of sun above the horizon at midday in the middle of winter is, I can guarantee it, none of us know, I've looked it up, 15 degrees above the horizon compared to uh, yesterday, which I think was the longest day, where the height is about 61 degrees. So in the winter, shadowing is very significant, not just from tall buildings, but from any buildings that shield another's roof. And given that 
PV panels are going to be more and more important under the climate approach, if you can call it that, then I think we have a, a duty to consider the effect of these shadowings on adjoining properties. We've already heard that uh, many of these uh, tall buildings are set within the two and three story buildings that characterize the whole of the borough. So I would feel that the policy of tall buildings at minimum should take into account in the criteria that the council uses. At minimum, it should uh, assess how much shadowing there is of roof areas with, with or in future with PV panels. Uh, otherwise, we will have one approach to tall buildings in one part of the plan and another approach to encouraging retrofit of PV panels, amongst other things, on roofs in another part of the plan. That is a potential conflict. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Ms. Parsons, you've got your hand up. Thank you. Um, I'll keep this short, uh, but I just wanted to follow on from that comment um, saying it's been made and this is something that has come up in a number of appeals with us, noticeably the tulip, which was overturned, one of the reasons being it wasn't sustainable in terms of um, its height um, outweighing the heritage impacts, uh, given the uh, carbon intake it would take to construct and there is other evidence by Arup and some other universities I can't quite remember off the top of my head to show that once the building is over a certain height approximately eight meters it will not pay back the carbon it took to manufacture um, the materials extract the materials transport them uh, construct the building and then operate it um, in its lifetime we're talking these buildings only last 20 you know 30 to 50 years approximately so unless some uh, major building innovation construction measures happen it is something that is playing out in decision making in terms of providing a clear and convincing justification for harm to heritage we don't really know how any of this is playing out in the local plan examination so that's why i thought i'd raise it now saying it was already raised but at the moment there isn't quite a there isn't really uh, an area that it can be squeezed into uh, but i just thought i'd make that point thank you yeah that's that's useful context and particularly yeah um aware of the the i think it was a called in application wasn't it relating to the tulip and and some of the considerations there but yeah thank you for drawing that to my attention but in in terms of those points i, th I think there's this kind of a big strategic point there that would be quite challenging to deal with at this stage of the plan there's the climate change policies that are, will relate relate to the um structure and fabric of the building um there's the there's the sustainable locations of the building as well which is another uh, factor to be taken into account but i, I suppose just in the, the very detailed point that Mr. Michael raises about the, sh the shading. Now, we've already talked about that in terms of residential amenity, but is, is, is there anything um, do you think that needs to be done in terms of that particular point? I just briefly on the first a couple of points about um, the impact of taller buildings on carbon use, uh, say, and yes, we were aware of the, the tulip uh, situation and to say we're not proposing any buildings as significant as the tulip in Merton. Um, on yes, it, it's well recognised that the bigger and taller a building gets, the more of a struggle it is to achieve sustainable some aspects of sustainable development. And as we've discussed last week, the plans policies look at are, are supported by evidence that looks at a range of scenarios. So, for example, the Council's housing viability study uh, looks at a range of scenarios from tiny little schemes down to um, many units, over hundreds of units with different building heights in them. Also, to point out on the sustainability front, 
Oh, and, and sorry, I should have said, and we can demonstrate viability of our carbon policies. Also to point out on that front, both the London plan and Merton's local plan propose a whole life carbon approach for um, sizable developments, not uh, which, which may or may not have taller buildings. And should a tall building ha ha struggle with achieving that whole life carbon approach, then that is the policy that would intervene at that point. Um, the second point about the shading on roofs at Regulation 19, the Wimbledon Society proposed an amendment to suggest that we should um, introduce a policy that prevented, I think, whether it was shading on existing roofs or shading on existing roofs with solar panels. I'm afraid I don't have um, it, uh, it right in front of me. Um, I think if there was that level of shading proposed by a building, be it tall or otherwise, so even five stories, which is, as we know, not defined as a taller building, if there was that level of shading, other policies such as daylight and sunlight would kick in and residential immunity very strongly. Um, and there will be, in urban areas, there will be a balance to be struck between these issues, but we do feel that if there was significant shading over a property, um, it would not just affect the roof, but it would affect the immunity of local occupiers, and that would be the issue that would uh, kick in. Thank you, Ms. Butler. So, any anything, any last points on on Wimbledon in terms of tall buildings before we move on to the Mitcham sites, Mr. Michael? Uh, Ms. Barnett. Okay, thank you. Um, so if we, if we can move on uh, to the Mitcham site. So we, we, we talked, um, talked about these to, to some extent yesterday. I'm, I'm going to invite Mr. Burton in in a minute, but I, I think these, are particularly the, the gas work site, and we, we discussed this yesterday, this is something that the evidence base is kind of moving on from Regulation 19. Um, Mr. Burton made made the point that it, the plan's kind of following the the application almost. It, that's a, a debatable point at the, at the minute. But in, in terms of the evidence base to support the um, the capacities that are, are now being proposed post regulation 19, I think this we're in a bit of a similar situation in a way to the Collier's Wood um, proposals, aren't we? In that in that that, narr that sort of narrative about how that's been arrived at isn't really before the examination. Um, and you said you provide a a topic paper on Collier's Wood. And whether something specifically on on those Mitcham sites, I think it'd be sensible to include um, Benedict Wharf in as well, because that, you know that's that's somewhere where, although that's a, a different stage in terms of development management, that, that's another area where tall buildings are, are seen as being uh, supported. So I think that's my, my first point on this that if, if that could be a, an action point that we add to the list thank you inspector yes we'll add the um uh, some sites to the list mi1 brains explorer for mi16 mitchum gas works i'd just like to state that uh yesterday mr ashton asked us to also asked us to reflect on the wording for site mi16 as one of the actions he made the point about around not being typical wording and maybe up to was more typical wording for the number of homes. Thank you. So if I could invite uh, Mr. Burton in with, with your views on those sites, particularly in terms of the tall building uh, aspects. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, despite some important changes um, to the plan, which uh, do make the approach to tall buildings clearer um, and ensure it's more compliant with the London plan. 
we still don't consider the approach uh, as presented to be sound or in conformity with the London plan uh, in relation to Mitcham and specifically in relation to MI16, um, Mitcham Gasworks. Uh, the London plan is clear that the definition of a tall building should be, quote, based on local context, as we've discussed. The local context for Mitcham has no precedent for any buildings above that minimum six stories um, defined uh, in the local plan um, that are relevant to um, the site. Um, and this has a, a direct bearing on the way in which the allocation for Mitcham Gas Works has um, changed significantly um, since the, the, the plan was submitted from an allocation that was initially from taller to nine storey um, to 10 storey um, or between March and May um, this year, uh, and remembering that there could, well, the, the current proposals would also include masts on top of the tallest um, of the uh, blocks that are being um, proposed. The major modifications that are being um, put forward by the Council also unhelpfully delete reference to giving consideration to the, quote, impacts on existing character, heritage and townscape. Uh, a development at all building on this site would be a major change to the urban morphology. Uh, in our view, it would harm the village character of Mitcham, and it would need a very strong evidence base to support it. And that's where we run into difficulties with uh, both the with, with the changes to the plan, which bring it into the tall building frame um, from the original um, proposals. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, the site allocation um, is driving the um, is being driven by the demands of the current planning application rather than setting out what's expected um, ahead of uh, a planning application coming forward. And for us, that's the antithesis of a plan led system. The council's pointed to the borough character study um, as the starting point. We flagged our concerns earlier, and I won't repeat them with the uh, borough, borough character study, both generically and in specifically in relation to uh, Mitcham Gasworks and the circularity of some of the rationale um, within that. We are very happy with the borough character study in principle and um, providing a starting point. But if we are to reach a finishing point, then there needs to be further evidence. And in relation to the site specific locations, as opposed to more neighbourhood based ones, there is no um, further evidence um, other than that, which I'll, I'll, I'll come on to um, that's in the um, public domain. Now, the only other evidence we're aware of um, is the work that's being done around a, pl a perspective planning application. Um, and since we met uh, yesterday, um, there's been a public consultation event um, by the developer of Mitcham Gasworks, um, which I know we don't need to go into the detail of here, but it's important to acknowledge and recognise that the developer was unable or unwilling to show a single image at that public consultation of what's being planned um, for the site um, as a whole. And although we were told verbally that significant urban design work has been undertaken, which would provide a rationale for the architecture and the heights, um, this would not be shared until a planning application was submitted, um, leaving us entirely in the dark when it comes to that as a relevant piece of evidence, which we don't think it can be considered as such for um, the local plan. We have had in the context of the local plan itself, this statement of common ground, which we've referenced earlier. Um, in our view, the townscape assessment at the, included within that is, is basic at best. Uh, and as residents were quick to point out yesterday, um, the images are very carefully selected in terms of where they're from. Um, they're of poor quality. Um, and it's unclear and it's not explained in anywhere um, as to why there seems to be a, a, a variation, even a pecked line as to what the intended height would be of the, the tallest um, building. Um, as a result, um, the, the, the evidence base that we have is the borough, borough character study um, with the problems that it's got, a 2010 background paper produced for a previous um, piece of the development plan and uh, scant at best information um, uh, and very little um, in the public domain from the developer. Um, if evidence does exist to support um, a tall building in Mitcham on this site, then it needs to be in the evidence library for the local plan. 
uh, and not left to unpublished information or, or conversations that are taking place between the council and developers uh, behind closed doors. It would be helpful to have that further information in, in the form that you have suggested. Um, equally, it's important that the, the plan is setting the lead here and not responding to it to what's coming forward. And our view is that the original allocation um, for Mitcham Gas Works is 200 to 400 homes uh, and making clear that the building uh, on the site should not be above six storeys um, is appropriate and would um, be consistent with the achievement of other plan objectives. On Benedict Wharf, um, we're very unhappy with the proposals and the fact that they have outlined planning consent does not in our view in any way demonstrate the suitability of the site for tall buildings but we acknowledge that that consent exists um, the evidence that we saw through that planning application process reinforced our view that uh, we were right to reach a conclusion as did the developers um, that buildings of 10 stories or more were, were inappropriate um, but that was subsequently changed in response to um, the considerations by the GLA. We um, have therefore made a number of proposals in our more detailed um, uh, evidence to the examination for how that site allocation can be strengthened, which will in some way help to either mitigate or, or address some of the, the consequences as and when that development moves forward to reserve matters. Um, and we'd ask that you consider those recognizing that they are go beyond the, the the tall buildings question which is before us today thank you well, thank you I, I think we're taking that probably as far as we can do today uh, we've heard mr burton's views um you, you've heard my views in terms of the evidence uh it's, it's important that you know the evidence that's supporting the plan is is in you know is in the public domain and is in the examination library particularly I, th I think um it'd be sensible to to perhaps park this until stage two uh until we've got that more detailed narrative that we talked about and then pick pick up those issues further there um i, I presume that is achievable Ms. butler yes inspector Okay, so Mr. Burton, if we could pick up those discussions then in October when that material has been produced, I think that would be the most sensible way forward. Uh, the only point which is self-evident and I, I guess is outside our control is we could see a planning application between now and, and then. Yeah, that, that's understood, but obviously that's that's not something I'll be I'll be determining. But you know, the sameness of the policies is is something that. Um, that's a matter for this examination. Okay, is there anything else uh, on the Mitcham sites? No. Okay. Right. Um, well, that that concludes the questions I had on tall buildings um, for this afternoon. Is is there anything else anybody wants to say? Firstly, on the um, the Zoom feed uh, before we adjourn and move on to matter 15. Okay, and uh, in the room, Mr. Michael. Okay, Mr. Burton. Okay, so uh, thank you all for your contributions um, this morning and this afternoon. Um, it's been a useful discussion. Um, I'd, I'd suggest we take a short 10 minute break, come back at quarter past. Um, and then we'll we'll continue with our discussion of matter 15 um so this but this concludes our discussions on matter 13 so that this particular hearing session is concluded good miss butler you look like you want to say something no thanks okay yeah so uh the we'll come back at quarter past um but otherwise uh you know, thank you again for your contributions